Okay, picking up. <clears throat> um, I want to spend just a couple of minutes over Act 1, Scene 2. I know we, we very, very briefly talked about it the other day, but I want to um, spend maybe five more minutes. <clears throat> Probably not even that much. Already mentioned that these characters are called either rude mechanicals, rustics, and often clowns. I really don't think using the term clowns to describe them is appropriate. Um, just because clown in our modern usage has a totally different connotation than it would have in Shakespeare's day. Okay, So, in Act 1, Scene 2, it's a very, very brief scene, and it is there solely for one purpose, and that's for Peter Quince, kind of the leader of the group, to hand out parts of the play within the play to the other members, okay? And Shakespeare does that, does that so that he can introduce us to the character of Nick Bottom, okay? And notice he hands out the parts, and he tells them, page 1189, line, oh, line 9, <clears throat> that the play is called The Most Lamentable Comedy and Most Cruel Death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Just that short line tells us a little bit about the kind of play they're going to produce. The most lamentable comedy. Now, in Shakespeare's day, as today, it doesn't really change, you wouldn't use the adjective lamentable to describe a comedy. What should come after lamentable? If something is to be lamented, that is, it's something to be mourned over, something to be sorrowed over. Comedies usually don't fit that bill. Tragedy, yes, okay? So they're gonna produce something that is to be mourned and sorrowed over, and yet it is also supposed to be, you know, the kind of play that I mentioned before, where you have a happy resolution at the end. It's supposed to be joyful. So how can you be sorrowful and joyful at the same time? So, he and Bottom kind of go back and forth, and he tells Bottom he's going to play the part of Pyramus. Bottom, what is Pyramus? A lover or a tyrant? A lover that kills himself most gallant for love. And that kind of tells us what kind of player are we in? What kind of Shakespeare play are we in? Who kills themselves for loves? Love, not loves. Romeo and Juliet, thank you, okay? Which is a tragedy, not a comedy. So if somebody kills himself for love, you're not talking comedy. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. If I'm really going to do this well, I will have to be able to produce tears on the spot. If I do, let the audience look to their eyes. Bottom is telling us, oh, I'm so good. I'm going to make the audience full of tears. I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. To the rest, my chief humor, that is my inner being, what I would really like to do is be a tyrant. I could play Hercules, Hercules. And he goes on and quotes some lines, okay? And so he, Quince, hands flute his part, okay? You're going to be Thisbe. What is Thisbe? A wandering knight, okay? And flute is a young man, probably late teens, maybe a little bit younger, maybe 16, 17. What is this be? A wandering knight. It is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, faith, let not me play a woman. I have a beard coming. That is, I've got a couple of hairs on my chin. He's just starting to grow a beard. 
In Shakespeare's day, pretty sure your introduction mentioned this, all the actors were men. Women weren't allowed to act, okay? So all the women's roles are played by men and or young boys, teenagers to very just before puberty, 10, 11, 12 years old, up through 17, 18, 19 years old, played the roles, roles of the women, uh, the female characters, okay? He said, no, I can't. Quince, that's all one, doesn't matter. You shall play it in a mask. Don't worry, we're not gonna hide your beard. Your, your, your beard is irrelevant, you're gonna be wearing a mask, right? And you may speak as small as you will, is what that means. Bottom, and I may hide my face, that is, if I could hide my face, let me play Thisbe too. So, I'll play Pyramus, the lover of Thisbe, and I'll play Thisbe, the lover of Pyramus. How well is that gonna come off on a stage? Yeah, not very well. Though, who was it? Kevin Klein, the same guy that I mentioned, who does um, this play, also did a one-man one version of, boy, I wanna say this, but I know it's not this. I think it's Hamlet. Did a one-man version of Hamlet. Hamlet. Yeah, I think that's it. Very, very much condensed. Okay. And he says, I'll speak in a monstrous little voice. Thisney, Thisney is what he ought to do. Oh, Pyramus, my liver dear, thou Thisbe, etc. No, you play This you play Pyramus, flute, you Thisbe. Okay, go ahead. So he gives Robin Starbling his part. You're going to play Thisbe's mother. Doesn't have any lines. Snout, you're going to play uh, Snout the Tinker, yes. You're going to play Pyramus's father. They're also going to do other roles because Thisbe's mother and Thisbe's father don't say anything. Okay? So, he comes to Snug, the joiner. You're going to play the lion's part. Have you the lion's part written? Okay, again, they're not used to thinking a lot. What's the, you know, what kind of lines do you need for a lion? Roar. That's pretty much it, okay? Bottom, let me play the lion too. Notice what Bottom's doing. It's almost every role, let me, let me, let me, okay? And he says, you know, I'll play the lion so Lionishly, I'll scare the women, you know, etc. Okay. So we're going to stop with that. Turn to Act Two. All right. So now we are in the wood, and we're going to be in the wood till the end of Act Four, Scene One. Okay. So the majority of the play occurs in the wood. All right. And, and keep in mind some of the terms we, we've used to discuss the wood. Chaos. Nature. Um, no law. No civilization, etc. Okay? You can really call it unreality versus the harsh, hard, real reality of someplace like Athens. So we have a fairy come in through one door. In Shakespeare's stage, if you turn back to the page in the intro to um, the Shakespeare part, you see what the globe looks like. You've got a stage that looks like this. Theater is like that. Um, this is called the yard, okay? The theater itself, this is where the seating is, and there are three levels, all right? Here's a 
big column here and a big column here because it's holding up the roof that actually let me back that up a little bit about here and here because it's holding up the roof that comes out and partially covers the stage right <clears throat> Depending upon the play, I've seen plays at Shakespeare's Globe that have had two doors here or that have had three doors. There are actually three doors in that wall, but that whole wall can be removed, right? And this is called, in the back here, this is called the tiring house, right? This is where actors enter from and go back off the stage usually it's where they change costumes refresh themselves for their lines get a drink of water etc etc okay people who stand here are called gremlins they paid one penny to get in right if you go to shakespeare's globe today go to london go to shakespeare's globe you pay five pounds for a gremlin ticket you have to stand the entire production, except for during the intermission when you can go out and get a beer, you know, et cetera. But when you come back in, you have to stand. If you try to sit down on the ground, one of the docents will come and make you stand. Similarly, if it starts pouring and you pop open an umbrella, they're gonna come over and either tell you to take the umbrella down or take it from you. Why? It obscures the view of the people behind you. Because this will usually be packed. It holds about 700 people. And it's not that big. All right? Um, so, the wood near Athens, the two fairies enter in. One enters through this door, and another one enters through that door. Okay? This is, if I remember correctly, I don't think your introduction of this one tells you. I think this is about 42 feet wide and about 24 feet deep. Okay? And it stands, let's see how tall my wife. Stands about that tall. Okay? Uh, when we first went to um, the Globe together in whatever year it was, 2002, we got Gremlin tickets to Midsummer Night's Dream. It's the best production I've ever seen, by the way. And we stood, we got there early, and we stood dead center of the stage. And she was literally like this. Because she's like five one, right? And I'm, we're gonna, when we get to a part in the play, I'm gonna talk about something that occurred there. So we were there, and I mean, it's lined all the way around. And then people packed. I mean, you have like maybe that much space before you're touching somebody else. It's, Always, no matter the play. Okay. So, two fairies come in. One at one door, Robin Goodfellow, a.k.a. Puck, at another. Okay. So, the one fairy addresses Puck when Puck asks, Whither wander you? Where are you going? And the fairy says, and notice, by the way, when the fairies speak, how do they speak? Everything's in poetry. Fairies speak in rhyme, okay? The humans don't. So the fairy says, you know, what he does, and then says at the very end of his or her speech, our queen comes anon. The queen is Titania, queen of the fairies. Puck, the king that is Oberon, the king of the fairies, doth keep his revels here tonight. Take heed, the queen come not within his sight. Why? For Oberon is passing fell, angry, and wrath, because that she as her attendant hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She ne'er had so sweet a changeling. Okay? So we find out the king and queen of the fairies, they're kind of at loggerheads. They're not getting along. Why? Because the queen has in her train, in her followers, a lovely Indian boy. Not Native American, Indian, Indian kind of thing, okay? And we're told she never had so sweet a changeling. You've got a gloss, child exchanged for another by the fairies. It's not a good enough gloss. 
The idea of a changeling child from Shakespeare's day, this play is written around 1595, I believe. It's got a date, I think, at the beginning of it. Yeah, 1595. Um, the idea of a changeling goes back several hundred years, okay? And it's a means, it is a means of explaining or justifying why your child doesn't behave the way your child should behave. It's not your child. It's somebody else's child. More specifically, the way it's usually done is it's a fairy child. Why? Because the fairies have come and taken your child, switched at birth. Because the fairies like humans as slaves, essentially. In some of the later medieval literature, 12, 13, 1400, those slaves are usual sex, usually sex slaves. I mean, we have nothing on sex trafficking compared to the fairies in medieval literature, so to speak. Okay? So, she's taken this young boy. Why? To have sex with? No. Because the boy's mother, we're told, was a devotress of hers. That is, the boy's mother kind of worshipped Titania. And is dead. So she's adopted the child. Oberon wants the boy to be in his following. He wants to train him up to essentially be one of his henchmen. Okay? So Puck goes on, but she perforce withholds the loved boy, crowns him with flowers, makes him all her joy. And now they, Oberon and Titania, never meet in grove or green by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen, but they do square. What does that mean? It's like two boxers when they enter a ring, they square off, they take their positions, Battle will ensue. So what are we told about the love relationship in the fairy world? It's not good. Okay? In Shakespeare's day, anything that happened in the quote-unquote spiritual realm, and here we could call this kind of the spiritual realm, the supernatural world, had repercussions down here in the physical realm world called a doctrine of correspondences so something happened out there it has a kind of a ripple effect down here okay so you've got a problem with the love relationship in that world what is the ripple effect going to be down here you're going to have problems in love relationships down here how did the play begin Hippolyta, excuse me, Theseus and Hippolyta talking. Theseus addresses her. He says, I can't wait the four long days. She says, those four days will go by very quickly. She kind of implies, I can wait. And then we find out how he wooed her. He beat her, both figuratively and literally, with his sword, defeating her in battle. So that's not a relationship, you know, based on let's say 21st century ideas of equality and equal partnership and all that kind of stuff. It's pure domination. Fairy. Aren't you that shrewd and knavish sprite called Robin Goodfellow? Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Skim milk. Sorry, left something off, I think. No, the frights the maidens of the village. Skim milk and sometimes labor in the corner and bootless make the breathless housewife churn. That is, she's sitting there churning the cream, trying to make butter, and it won't turn into butter. Aren't you the one who screws around, messes with humans' lives? Aren't you him? Thou speakest to right. I am that merry wanderer of the night. What does Mary imply? Happy, what else? Joyful. Keep going. How does it apply to what 
the other fairy has said about him? Okay. Is he malicious? No. Does he intend evil or harm? No. He's a practical joker. He's a prankster. Now, everybody knows practical jokes and pranks can what? <laughs> they can go too far. Okay. So he says, I jest to Oberon and make him smile. When I, a fat and bean fed horse beguile, neighing in likeness of a filly of a filly fool. And sometimes, so he pretends to be a fool around a stallion. He gets the horse to leave where it is and follow him off. Neighing and like this, and sometimes lurk I in a gossip's bowl in very likeness of a roasted crab. And you've got a thing down there. Uh, gossip old woman's crab, crab apple, etc. Okay? Then he says, here comes Oberon. And so Oberon comes in. He comes in where is it? at one door, and notice Titania comes in at another door. He comes in with all of his fairies following him. She comes in with all of her fairies, her retinue following her. And I think in almost every production I've seen, they're all giving each other the dirty eye. I mean, Oberon's men are looking at Titania's women, because that's how they usually divide up, and giving them, you know, a dirty look. And they're reciprocating. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. Ill meant. We're not meeting for, for good here. Okay? And notice it is by moonlight. Why? Because the fairies are creatures of darkness. I don't mean they're not evil. Well, depending on how you construe them. Some versions they're evil, others they're not evil. Okay? But they're creatures of the night, not the daytime. That's why you don't see them during the daytime. Okay? What? Jealous Oberon? So we, from their own mouths, we get, you know, this contention. Fairy Skip Hint, she's speaking to her followers. I have forsworn his bed and company. So, we're not sleeping together. And we're not even staying, you know, in the same location together. I can't say room, because they don't live in a house. They live in the wild nature. Okay. Keep in mind, the fairy, where is it? The fairies represent all of this too. Chaos, wild nature, no law, no civilization, etc. Terry, rash, wanton. You've got a gloss there, 60. Where is it? Headstrong creature. Yes and no. I mean, yes, wanton does mean that. Wanton also means, however, sexually loose. He's accusing his wife of being promiscuous. Okay? Am not I thy Lord? That is, aren't I your master? Then I must be thy lady, she replied. And I think she replies that very demurely and kind of coquettishly. But I know when thou hast stolen away from fairyland and in the shape of corn sat all day, playing on the pipes of corn and versing love to amorous Philida. So he calls her a wanton. He says, I'm your lord. She says, oh, then I must be your lady. But I know when you leave the realm of fairyland, not just the wood, that is, leave the kind of invisible world of the fairies and make yourself visible in the physical world and do what? You sit all day playing on pipes and versing love to Philida. And you've got a footnote, conventional names of pastoral lovers. Philida, the female, corn, the male. She's saying, I know when you get up and leave, and you go off to court, make love to, Philida, the farmer's daughter, kind of a thing. 
Why art thou here come from the farthest step of India? Step meaning like mountainous plateau, so to speak. All right. Well, why was he in India to begin with? To get the young boy whom she has. But that pursuit, the bouncing Amazon. Who's the bouncing Amazon? And I literally, I don't think I've ever seen any text or edition of this play gloss the word bouncing. Why would you refer to an Amazon as bouncing? I mean, it's not like she's hopping around all the time. Okay? But that forsooth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskined mistress, wearing half boots called buskins. That's all that refers to. And your warrior love. I know why you're not in India. You're here because of Hippolyta. And notice what she calls Hippolyta. Your mistress. Now notice Hippolyta is getting ready to marry Theseus. Your buskin mistress and your warrior love to Theseus must be wedded. And you come to give their bed joy and prosperity. She's not saying, she doesn't say, you've come to have your last fling, so to speak, with Hippolyta. No, no, no. You're here to bless their wedding. We will see a blessing at the very end of the play. Now, almost the very end, just before the last speech. So he says, how canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta, knowing I know thy love to Theseus? How in the world can you speak about my relationship with, Titania, with Hippolyta when I know what you and Theseus have? Didst not thou lead him through the glimmering night from Perigenia, whom he ravished? See, Theseus is known in Greek mythology, for lack of a better term, as a rapist. And make him with fair Aegilus break his faith with Ariadne and Antiope. And you've got a footnote, you know. Paraguna, one of Theseus' conquests, she and the following women are named in Thomas North's translation of Plutarch's Life of Theseus. That's probably one of the sources for Shakespeare's play. He'd read Thomas North's translation of Plutarch's lives. Plutarch was a first century uh, Roman, I believe, who wrote a series of lives of famous people, assuming Theseus was real, okay? These are the forgeries of jealousy. In other words, you're not really jealous. You're pretending to be. And never since the middle summer spring met we on hill, in dale, forest, or mead, by paved fountain, or by rushy brook, or in the beached margin of the sea, to dance our rings to the whistling wind. Okay? To the middle summer spring, the beginning of midsummer. They haven't what? They haven't come together. They haven't met in love. I don't necessarily mean sex. I mean, they just haven't been in each other's company. They've been separated since the beginning of midsummer. And I'll tell you right now, I have no idea what the beginning of midsummer is in the ending of midsummer. If summer begins June 21st, then it kind of seems like midsummer would be late July, beginning of August, something like that. Because fall begins. All the Brits call it autumn. Autumn begins September 22nd. And yet we're going to see a line referred to here where people are going to do the rites of May. Rites of May are usually performed on May 1st, May Day. Well, that's not summer. You're not even close to summer. You're still in the middle of spring there. Okay? So she goes on and says... So we haven't come together. We haven't been peaceful with each other. Therefore, line 88 or 89, the winds piping to us in vain as in revenge have sucked up from the sea contagious fogs, 
which falling in the land hath every pelting river made so proud, blah, blah, blah. So because there is discord between Titania and Oberon, she says the natural world is doing what? It is also full of discord. Okay? Although Shakespeare didn't have this term. This term came, term was invented late 1600s, very, yeah, late 1600s. There was this idea that was still prominent in Shakespeare's time of what's been called the great chain of being. Being just meaning existence, okay? And that is that everything that is created, which is down here, exists in a great chain of existence, all the way down to the lowest part of physical reality, okay? The very highest are, or is, the angelic realm. And the highest of that is the highest link, cherubim and seraphim, according to traditional Judeo-Christian Christianity. Okay? So you have the angelic, and if, we, if I were to do this accurately, this would have nine levels, because there are nine ranks of angels. So let's say, just put this here, nine ranks of angels. We'll use three to represent that. And then beneath the angelic realm, you have the human realm. Beneath the human realm, you have the animal realm. Beneath that, you have the vegetable, plant life, etc., and all the way down to whatever, okay? So, just as there are nine ranks of angels, or nine levels, or a hierarchy, right, of angels, there's a hierarchy in the human society. Who's at the top? Let's say in American society. Who's at the top, so to speak? The rich and the poor. Rich, okay, be more specific. I want a name. Who's at the top of American society, um, uh, the American country? Elon Musk. President. Yeah, probably, you know. Yeah. <laughs> he's at the top of the world society if you're talking wealth, okay? The president. The president's at the top of American culture. Great Britain, today, not two weeks ago. King Charles III, he's at the top. Not uh, three weeks ago, it would have been Queen Elizabeth. She died, he rose, okay? Who's just beneath him? Not his wife. Prince, Prince William, because he's next in line. Who's just beneath him? His eldest child. Charlotte or George? Charlotte. Because she can now, they changed the laws of primogenitor. It's not the eldest son anymore. That happened in William's life. It happened after his daughter was born. Parliament actually changed the law so that if Charles dies, William gets knocked off, Charlotte, at the ripe old age of eight or nine, would become queen. Okay? There would be somebody kind of standing behind her, telling her which buttons to push and you know what things to sign, etc. Animal realm, what's the king of the beasts? Lion. But is that all beasts? What kind of beasts are lions? Mammals, they're earth ground beasts. What's the king of the air? Eagle. Eagles. And therefore, if you're a Harry Potter fan, you have the Gryffindors. Lions, eagles combined. King of the air, king of the earth. Hey, it's very symbolic, by the way. Take my Harry Potter course. What else? What's the king of the ocean? Blue whale. Vegetables, it's not celery or broccoli or, you know, it would be either the tallest or the oldest tree, etc. Okay, so you have this whole kind of thing going on. And guess what happens? Now, between here and here, within the context of the play, we have to carve out the fairy realm. Because they're a little bit higher than us, but they're not angels. They're not angelic beings, 
right? But what happens if there's a break in the leaks? Everything down below, what's going to occur? Did you ever play um, as a kid with people, you know, roller rink or even out in the yard, some, um, what did we call it, whiplash? You get a bunch of people and you hold hands and you start swaying and you try to swing so that the person at the end of the chain literally gets flung off, okay? You break the link here and everything down here, it starts to wobble. Why? It no longer has solidity. It's not connected. That is what is happening in the natural world. Because that great chain of being, it includes the natural world. It includes rocks, it includes flowers, it includes stones and rivers. And so what, because there is a break in this realm, Oberon and Titania are not getting along, there's discord. That means from there down the chain of being, Discord is creeping in. How did the play begin? Yes? Um, sorry, I was going to ask um, a question. Mm -hmm. um, does Oberon not speak in realm like the other fairies do? Uh, let's see, he's only spoken one line there, one line there. No, he's not, and neither is Titania. But the other fairies are. The lesser fairies. I'm trying to remember, let me see, where's Puck? That's just one sentence. Good question. No, Oberon and Titania do not. Um, where do we see that discord at the beginning of the play? No, don't think Theseus and Hippolyta. Aegeus comes up. His daughter. According to this, okay, within the human realm, so we talked about, you know, the king or the president, what is the basis of every society? Family. What's the problem? Father, daughter, and she's doing what? She's kind of elevating herself to his same level. There's discord. There's chaos. And it goes all the way throughout, okay? So, she goes on talks about what else is happening. So there's fog everywhere. The rivers are rising over their banks. Plants are dying. Cattle aren't giving birth, et cetera, et cetera. People are always cold. She gives a big, long speech. So Oberon finishes, right? She finishes her speech and says, line 118. Uh, let me back up. Line 117. Titania finishes her speech with, we are their parents and original. And you've got a gloss down there. Origin. That is, we are their source. She doesn't mean we have begotten them, we have created them. She means we're the model that they kind of follow. All right? Oberon, do you amend it then? She's just gone on this big, long list of all the problems in the human realm and the natural world. And Oberon says, fix it. It lies in you. What's he saying, really? It's your fault. Yeah, this is your fault. If you would just listen to me and do what I want, everything would be solved. As my wife would probably say, typical male response. Why should Titania cross, cross her Oberon? Notice the, the visual image there in that metaphor. That use of that word cross is a metaphor. Is they should be going on their journey's path like this, side by side. And instead, what are they doing? Well, as we saw in Oedipus the King, what happens when an immovable force meets another immovable force? Think of the crossroads. Something's got to give. I do but beg a little changeling boy to be my henchman. That's all I want. Give me the little kid and everything will be happy again. Set your heart at rest. 
And I kind of imagine, if I were directing this, I would have Titania pause at that point. Set your heart at rest. And I would tell whoever is playing Oberon, kind of give a look of relief. Oh, finally. And then she goes on. The fairy land buys not the child of me. Your whole realm could not purchase him from me. His mother was a votress of my order. And in the spice of Indian air by night, full often hath she gossiped by my side. That is, talk with me. And sat with me on Neptune's yellow sands, marking the embarking traders on the flood. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? She says, and for her sake do I rear up her boy. And for her sake I will not part with him. She's dead. I'm taking the child to myself, and I'm raising him for her. How long within this wood intend you to stay? Notice he just gets very down to business. Till after Theseus's wedding day. Notice, not after Hippolyta's, Theseus's. Because according to Oberon, she's the lover of Theseus, and according to Tanya, he's the lover of Hippolyta. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. Yes? So, are, do Oberon and Titania actually have relations with Theseus and Hippolyta, or are those just accusations? <sighs> That's a good question. Thank you. Um, within the actual text of the play, I think they're just accusations within kind of the larger world of kind of the mythic stories, it's probably fair to assume they do have relations with them. I mean, look at the little footnote about Theseus. We know he took advantage of a lot of women, okay? Oh, uh, Titania's not just your everyday, ordinary woman. Uh, if anything were to be happening there, and probably she would be taking advantage of him. And the same thing with Oberon and um, Hippolyta. Okay. So, he says, give me that boy and I'll go with you. Give me the boy and I'll go dance with you and your rebels. Sure. Notice she said, if you will patiently dance. What's patiently imply? What's the word patient imply? What do you have to do if you're patient? Wait. Wait. What's another meaning of the word patient? Like a hospital patient. You're sick. You're ill. Something's not right. And if you're sick or ill and something's not right, you're suffering. So she says, if you will suffer her and dance in our rounds, <clears throat> or if you will wait, is she implied, I'll give you the boy after the dance? No. Give me the boy and I'll go with you. Not for thy fairy kingdom. And that kind of goes back to the fairy land buys not the child of me. She, she makes it clear. Even if you offered me the entire fairy realm. Nope. Fairies away, we shall chide downright if I longer stay. In other words, we're really going to get into it if we stay. So she leaves with all of her retinue. And Oberon says, well, well, go thy way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. Something's going to happen, right? My gentle Puck, come hither. Now, nobody else would call Puck gentle because of the practical jokes he plays. Thou remember since once I sat upon a promontory and heard a mermaid on a dolphin bed uttering such dulcet and harmonious breath to the rude sea, blah, blah. He says, yes. Okay. He says, do you remember Cupid all armed? And he took aim at a fair vestal thrown it by the west. That is a vestal virgin. Okay. And he loosed his love shaft. He shot an arrow. He says, you remember that? He says, yes. You remember where the shaft landed? It 
didn't hit the virgin, by the way. He says, yes. 165. Yet marked I where the bolt of Cupid fell. It fell upon a little western flower before milk white, that is, it was all white, now purple with love's wound. And maidens call it love in idleness. And you've got a gloss down there. Pansy or heart's ease is what it's also called. Fetch me that flower. Why? The herb I showed thee once, the juice of it on sleeping eyelids laid will make, or there means either, either man or woman madly dote upon the next life creature that it sees. So we get complication beginning. Well, it's already been beginning because of Oberon and Titania. Now we're going to get an additional part of it. Fetch me this herb, he says. I'll put a girdle around the earth in 40 minutes. So that's telling us how fast puck can fly. He leaves, and Oberon speaks. And he says, Having once this juice, I'll watch Titania when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing when she waking, then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling donkey, or a busy ape. Notice, everything he names is what? A beast, an animal. She will what? She will pursue it with the soul of love. So, she falls asleep, I'm going to put some of the juice on her eyes, and I'm going to make it so that when she wakes up, there's going to be an animal Right next to her saying, when she opens her eyes, she'll fall madly in love. And before I take this charm from off her sight, as I can with another herb, I'll make her render up her page to me. I'll get the boy from her. Then I'll make her see correctly. But who comes here? Notice, little stage direction. Because Demetrius and Helena haven't entered yet. He hears a sound. And he turns, but then he says, I am invisible. <laughs> they can't see me. So Demetrius and Helena comes in, come in. And what do they say? We get them talking from 188 or so to 244. What is Helena saying to Demetrius, and how is Demetrius responding? Actually, Demetrius begins the speech, or begins the conversation. I love thee not. Therefore, pursue me not. Fancy Shakespearean way of saying, I don't love you, leave. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? She told Demetrius, remember? She told us she was going to tell Demetrius. The one I'll slay, Lysander, the other slayeth me. Ah, true love, you know, she's cut his heart with her. Helena, you draw me, you hard-hearted adamant. You got the gloss down there, okay, lodestone, magnet, with pun on hard-hearted, since adamant was also thought to be the hardest of all stones and was confused with the diamond. She's saying, you're like the magnet and I'm steel drawing me to you. But yet you draw not iron, for my heart is true as steel. Leave you your power to draw, and I shall have no power to follow you. He's trying to leave his power to draw, right? I don't love you. Go away. And she's not listening. Why not? Well, if we followed Lysander's lines, because he won her heart. It's almost like she doesn't have it anymore. She doesn't have control of it anymore. It's all in Demetrius's hands. Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair? Do not, I not in plainest truth tell you I do not nor I cannot love you? And even for that do I love you more. And she compares herself to what? A dog, a spaniel. <laughs> Tail wagging like crazy, just, you know, slobbering at him. He says, tempt me not, tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I'm sick when I do look on you. Now that's 
pretty low. You make me ill to look at you. She says, I am sick when I look not on you. And he brings up what? You shouldn't be out here alone with me in this wood. I mean, I'm a strong man. You're a weak woman. The ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. You are putting yourself in danger. She says, your virtue is my privilege. I'm not in danger because you are a virtuous man. You would never take advantage. So he says, then I'll run. Okay. Demetrius and Helena leave. Oberon, fare thee well, nymph, ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him from him, and he will seek your love. Why? He hasn't said it, but what's he implying? The same juice he can put on Titania's eyes to make her fall in love with whatever she sees, he can put on Demetrius's eyes to make him fall in love with Helena. So, Puck gives over on the flower. He tells Puck where Titania is sleeping. He says, take some of this. He says, I'm going to take some of this, and I'm going to streak it on her eyes so that when she wakes up, she'll fall in love with whatever she sees. And he gives Puck some of the juice and says, there is a sweet Athenian lady in love with a disdainful youth. Anoint his eyes, but do it when the next thing he espies may be the lady. Okay? So all Puck has to do is what? Find an Athenian young man, put the juice on his eyes, so that when he wakes up, he sees an Athenian young woman. Pretty simple task. What's the problem? What's going to be the complication? There's more than one Athenian youth in the wood, and there's more than one Athenian woman in the wood. So, we see Titania come in with her fairy, you know, train, and they sing to her. She falls asleep. Oberon comes in, squeezes the juice on her eyes. When the, What thou seest when thou dost wake, this is page 1199, line 32 or so. Do it for thy true love's sake. Take. Love and language for his sake, be it out, blah, blah, blah. Okay? Wake when some vile thing is near. Lysander and Hermia come in. Now notice, Oberon knows these aren't the same two that he saw earlier. And we hear them talk. It's nighttime, time for bed. Hermia says, Lysander, I'll sleep here, you sleep over there. He said, no, 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 no. One turf piece of grass will serve as bed for us both because it's going to get chilly. You know, body heat will keep us warm. And she says, um, lie further off, do not lie so near. He says, no, 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 don't mistake me. I'm not talking about that, you know. He says, loves take the meaning of love's comforts. I mean that unto my heart, unto yours is knit, et cetera, et cetera. And she's like, top of the next page, Lysander riddles very prettily. In other words, I know what you're getting at. You sleep over there, I'll sleep over here. They fall asleep. Puck comes in. He says, Athenian youth, Athenian woman. He puts the juice on Lysander's eyes. Demetrius and Helena come in, making a ruckus. And what happens? Line 11, uh, 109, page 1201. Lysander wakes up. And we're told... And run through fire, I will for thy sweet sake. He's responding to Helena's last words. Transparent Helena, nature shows art that through thy bosom makes me see thy heart. It's like everything about you is pure. And I see your heart and how good you are. And she's like, why are you talking like that? There's Hermia. 
Content with hernia? No. I do repent the tedious minutes I have I with her have spent. We'll pick up there for page Wednesday for Friday and get into Act Three. Um, I'll probably put up a quiz um, that will go through Act Three. I don't think I'll get it up today. It won't be due till. I don't know, middle of next week probably.